without further ado, one of the things we try to do in our, um, in, in our kickoff workshop is to really have one of our master teachers share their experience with everyone, because we often have a lot of new teachers joining us, share their experience of how they do History Day and looking at timelines and stuff. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But I am super excited to have Dr. Eden Stein with us today. Uh, I've known Eden a long time. Um, she, as she mentioned, she is an English language arts teacher down at Worth Worthington Hooker School. Um, and she teaches grades seven and eighth and probably is too modest to say that she has had students uh, go many times to nationals and some of her former students in high school have gone on to win national prizes. So really excited to have her and I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I'm happy to see that technology is working. Thank you to Doug. Yes, we had a few nervous tech moments. Um, um, in my school, we use Google Drive for everything, and I did take the precaution of downloading it, the presentation I had made, but I didn't realize when you download a file from Google Drive now, it just saves it as a Chrome. You still need Chrome to open it. So luckily, we were able to patch through, and I was able to open my file, though I could have talked without it. Rebecca, thank you so much for inviting me today. I really, you know, I'm thinking like coming to History Day, which I think it's been 20 years, was really a turning point for me. Um, it's been such a big part of my professional life and also reached over to my personal life. And I remember this um, coach came and I had come to teaching late. I was already an adult and I was certified in both history and language arts. And a coach, her name was Stephanie Fitzgerald, came into my room and told me about History Day. And I wasn't really, you know, I, I wasn't engaged. I didn't think it was going to be something. I wasn't really paying attention. And um, it took a little while for me to sink in, and let me just see how this is going to work. Yeah, that's my school. So it is a public school in New Haven, and I do want to talk a little bit about um, equity, and I was really impressed to hear that so many schools is, are having everybody do History Day, because in my school, everybody does History Day in some form or another. Um, but this book came to my hands, and some of you, Tony's laughing because he remembers this book. This book is outstanding. It's the story of a kid who did History Day. Hunter Scott was his name. He lived in Florida. He picked the topic because of Jaws, of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, and he ended up becoming so enthralled with this. He got primary sources, he interviewed people, um, survivors, and he ended up going all the way to Congress and helping exonerate the captain of the ship, um, Charles McVeigh. So it's really an incredible story, and the book is very well written. I love it. And um, it just goes to show how a topic can really drive a child. And I was listening to the conversation that we talked about with topics before, um, and I, I only overheard part of it. You might have said this, but sometimes a child has, um, or a student has a connection that they want to explore through their family background. And those have made some of the most powerful topic um, topics and projects that I've ever seen. And Rebecca mentioned the young woman. She was a high school student when she um, won at nationals for her paper on Malaga Island. But she got in interested in that because her family vacationed in Maine and she had been in a bookstore and picked up a book. You know, and, and her family went to Maine every summer, so she became very interested in Malaga, and it became this whole study about eugenics, and she used so many primary sources, and now that story is more well known. Um, some of you might not even know what I'm talking about, but, you know, and it, it's interesting the way we learn from our students as well because um, Malaga Island, which is the small island in Maine that where local mixed race residents were displaced because of their race. And it was during the time of the eugenics movement. And like I ended up doing my own professional study on eugenics and incorporating that into my teaching because of her, because of her project. And so we learn, you know, it just is such a beautiful circle, um, the way we learn from our students and the way um, History Day can impact people. 
And so I wanted to say something about teamwork, because part of the thing that has made History Day successful in my school is that we do it as a team. And I'm here today, but it could have been Kristen. She's the social studies teacher at my school. And, sh and the way we have it divided is all students in my school, and I'm going to talk about this some more, do a research paper first. And, um, and then she helps them with their projects they do during her class time. We're all helping, but first they write the research paper. Beth Hart has retired. She was our library media services person for many years, and she, um, through me, also latched onto History Day, and she ended up making a really beautiful website, which I, you know, know Rebecca has used to help kind of revamp, you know, the state website and having a lot of links for students is really key with that. Um, so, you know, I ha have no qualms about spending so much time on history, history Day in my English classroom because it's best practices. Students must learn how to do research in the English language arts classroom, and so all the things I teach them are things that they would have to learn anyway, but this way it's driven by a theme and a topic that they have chosen for themselves. So I really, really love this piece of it, and though it had, didn't start off being at part of my district curriculum, I have sold it to any supervisor or curriculum manager because it includes so many standards. And the workbook that um, Rebecca put together for Connecticut History Day was really beautiful, and it lists all those standards for you. So you can always justify what you're doing. And we tell, we do spend some time on topic selection, and I already talked about it a little bit, but the students, I tell them, you have to find a topic that you love. You're gonna be working on this for a couple of months between the research paper and the project, and you're gonna be reading about it and spending a lot of time on it, so I really want them to find something. You know, when if it's a kid who's only, you know, who's really, really interested in sports, like, you can find a sports-related topic about just uh, just about any theme and so we do explore those personal interests whether it's music whether it's sports whether it's film whether it's musicals or if it's a place that the student loves or a family connection um, it can be just really there's so many possibilities and you know student choice is another best practice I love giving my students you know, free reign. I had, in earlier years, I had tried to tie it more into the curriculum and have seventh graders do world history and eighth graders do U.S. history. And I kind of abandoned that because world history topics can be very difficult for students to access and understand primary sources. And because primary sources are such an important part, you know, sometimes topics that have happened in the last two or 300 years are more accessible. You know, it depends, again, what grade level. I'm teaching middle school. Um, some, a te you know, some, Lenny had asked at my table about um, sixth graders. You know, sixth graders, and our fifth graders actually do a mini prehistory you know, project uh, to get them used to the idea. And it makes sense for them to have topics that are going to be, you know, a little bit easier for them to research. And, you know, bright students who have more skills can do things that are more complex. Um, so we scaffold this research paper very, very closely. And I know um, in the workbook that you all have, there's a lot of um, ideas for mini lessons, but we give them, we start off by letting them know kind of basic dates, and these are just samples, I think those are my dates from last year. Um, you know, what day their topic needs to be chosen, um, we have the theme graphic organizer on a date, notes check, and I'm going to talk about these steps a little bit individually. And if anybody wants to jump in or ask a question, feel free. I would love it. We have a lot of experts here. Um, Eden, I just wanted to mention that um, we will share the slides with you. Um, so yeah, I hear the uh, few. Um, and yeah. I also have a hand, the handout that yes. you 
It's on the front uh, table. Yeah, so let's wait. Okay. Uh, but, um, but we'll leave the Yeah, I have a handout that goes through a lot of this. And also, I'm available. You can email me, and you can have copies of the slide deck. Um, so again, these dates are not for this year. They were plugged in from last year, but we have an idea of when we want their first draft due. I used to have it done, have it due before Chris, before the winter holiday break, and I then decided I don't really want to have all those papers at home with me <laughs> over holiday break, and so we have it we have it due the week after, and it works out well because there's just plenty of time still for them to revise and for them to then work on their actual final projects. Um, and then with the registration for state contest, obviously we, um, not everybody goes to the, to the regional contests or to the state contests, but we do help the students that are going to do that. So just a word about note taking. Um, and my links, I had linked to my presentation about note-taking. We teach students several different forms of note-taking in ELA. Um, I used, we required the use of Cornell notes for years. It's still really my preferred way of taking notes for History Day. Um, but not everybody does really well with it. Um, but we do find a system for them to keep track of their sources right from the beginning because it's going to make the bibliography so much simpler. And things have changed a lot over the past few years. You know, everything is done digitally, and if the students are, you know, cutting and pasting at least the links to their web pages, um, they're using online bibliography makers to keep track of their sources, but I want them to keep their notes connected to their sources because they have to know where the information came from um, in order to, do, to document it for their research paper. They are all writing a research paper, even if they're going to do a documentary website or performance. And it really makes the social studies um, end of it much simpler and the project creation because they've already done the major research and they can really focus on making it a beautiful project and do more and add more primary sources definitely while they're working on the project they're very inspired um, at that point to really dig deeply into more primary sources. So at this point they've cho they've um, accessed the their topics, they've chosen their topics, they've started taking notes, they do take notes in class. This is not a homework assignment. I mean, they can work on it at home, and many do, um, but I'm a big believer in using class time as well so we can supervise research. It's not a cut and paste kind of thing. I will be very interested to see the kind of um, history date paper chat GBT can write. I will probably try to do it myself. It's really fascinating. I'm not, you know, the kind of person who's going to push AI away. It's going to be a big part of our lives. And I'm not suggesting that we, have, you know, have students use it. But as teachers, we need to know, I believe, how to use it and how it's impacting our students. And really, the only way to know that they're writing their papers themselves is to watch them do it through the process. Not necessarily type every word, but you know, seeing the paragraphs come in, seeing the different drafts, seeing the sources they use. Um, you know, we use a program called GoGuardian while they're, and most of you probably know that, while they're on their Chromebooks, we can see what they're doing. So this seems very basic. This is an English teacher's, you know, the nuts and bolts of English teacher at the, mu at the middle school level is teaching them how to introduce and explain quotes. And they, um, his, for History Day papers, you can use either MLA citation or Chicago. The, there is a preference, I think, for Chicago among historians, and we have found that students who wind up competing do end up using Chicago citation for their research papers. However, as an English teacher in a public district public school, we use MLA. And so the students do learn MLA, and 
um, you know, the quotes in, which is really important. They have to be able to introduce, cite, and explain their quotes and not just string them together. And over the years, I found all kinds of shortcuts. Um, even though they're using online citation makers, I think it's really important for them to know what's in the citation and how it's structured. Because once you start competing at the regional level, at the state level, and at the national level, your citations are key. Um, in the annotated bibliography, they have to be done correctly, and you know a researcher has to be able to access whatever sources the student used. Um, so it is really important, and it's more meaningful them to understand the nuts and bolts of the citation. Um, so another thing as an English teacher, best practices uh, is teaching the writing process. This isn't a one and done um, deal. This is a you know a multi draft um, writing process where they're writing a first draft. Um, they're doing their very best job in it, and you know because this is such a a huge thing for a sixth grader or seventh grader to do, it gets graded on a scale of 100 points, and the first draft isn't necessarily going to achieve, you know, more than a C plus or a B minus. And we have students who do not accept grades like that. So that the way I work as an English teacher, they can improve their grades by doing a second draft. They can go back after I've, you know, perused their paper very carefully and marked the sections and the places that need to improve. If they go back and improve it, they can raise their grade. So it's not like a punitive grade, like, oh my goodness, you didn't get this the first time. It's more like a learning experience. And that's really, you know, what this is about. And I think, you know, teaching students the possibility of loving research and loving paper writing is that it is a learning experience and it's something that they can um, they can continually revise. So they've handed in their research paper to me in January. They've gotten it back. They've revised it. And now it's the fun time to really create the project. And this year is going to be a little different because in the past we have given students free reign with which type of project they wanted to do. I mean, we still will do that. Though I will say in my school we did limit group work. Um, because it's such a big part of how they're spending their class time, they obviously they need to write their research paper individually, and then we would allow them to join into groups of two for exhibit boards and websites and we and uh, larger groups for performances. And that's just a decision. I'm not suggesting other people do that. It's just we needed to make sure that we knew who was doing the work and that everybody's working. Rebecca? I want to say I think that's a great example of you are the master of your classroom and so our group limits are two to five but we often have schools because I have gotten those calls when groups implode by the time of like state contest um, and so it's really up, in your, up to you if you want to say hey you can be a group of two or three and I just want to also say we'll talk a little bit more about the new kind of limits on projects but um, I, I think it, Eden, you're showing some great examples of, you know, take what the <coughs> parameters of History Day are, but make it work for your classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this has been tweaked over many years. Um, you know, Kristen and I have been worked, working together for more than 10 years on this. I did it previously to that. So we just found through trial and error what worked in our school and with our particular students. And to some extent, that's also um, changes, you know, from year to year, depending on our student makeup and what is going on during that year. We did continue to do it during COVID. We weren't sure we were going to be able to, and we were remote for a year. And we did, um, you know, we did manage to have some, you know, projects be completed and we com we competed, you know, when the contests were remote. And it, for some students, I'm sure it's what gave their life meaning for a few months during that time. Um, so 
the so you know the fact that the social studies teacher is working on this in her she's giving time in her classroom for students to put their projects together and again the support from the LMS person particularly with technology and the websites where we weren't experts even with documentaries to some extent um, the library media services um, expert can be invaluable in making sure that students have the info they need. Um, we can't really, they have Chromebooks, which really aren't good enough to make a documentary on. The students who are making documentaries are mostly using iMovie and their own personal Apple computers to do that. Um, and, you know, we have no qualms about pulling in the drama teacher to help stage your performance and getting help from wherever we can get it. So I know this is hard to see, and the, only, the reason why I wanted to put it up is because um, the social studies teacher also has scaffolded due dates, staggered due dates for the parts of the project. And she, we, we started a number of years ago dividing things into um, the kind of backup, the build up and background, then the heart of the story, and then the short and long term impacts. And I can see some nods. A lot of teachers use that. Um, it's used, I think, did it, it might have originally come from Minnesota, their note, their workbook, and the way they take notes. But it helps the students access, like, the big picture of things. Because we have to spend, in middle school, and this year, my students are so concrete. I was trying to explain yesterday why um, eyes could be an ocean, the ocean eyes, and they couldn't grasp it. They didn't, you know, the metaphor, the idea behind that metaphor, they're very concrete thinkers. And so I, we, we have to spend a lot of time explaining context and making sure it's not only the, it's, it is the theme, it is the topic, but it's also the context. It's not only a timeline of what led up to the turning point, especially with turning points. It's the context of what's going on in the world at that time. And so that takes a little bit of effort to really communicate to the students. The heart of the story is the easy part, and sometimes it's the shortest part of the paper or the project. And then short and long-term impacts also. We used to be more strict at dividing them into short-term impacts and long-term impacts. And then we found that with a lot of topics, it doesn't make sense to necessarily divide it that way. The impacts overlap. And, you know, in the short term, little things change, but in the long term, you know, big things change, and it's, it's really a continuous process of change. So, um, so she has, we have different dates for the different parts. Um, we have the performance, though no script is necessary to hand in for uh, regional competitions, the students who are doing performances for our sake, they have to write out scripts. Um, the exhibit boards need to be mocked, sketched out and mocked up before they're put together. And the websites are started very early so the students can start learning the tech and placing the things in the proper way and getting it all to look really sharp. And then the bibliographies are the last piece. And so now students who aren't going on to region are not necessarily in my school gonna do annotated bibliographies or process papers. We do have, they all do an MLA bibliography, but only the ones now who have signed, because by this time in the year, they have had to sign up if they're gonna, um, if they're gonna comp compete at the regional or district level, so they have to know, um, and so we know who needs to do an annotated bibliography and a process paper. And um, the history teacher has a rubric because um, she needs to grade their website <laughs> um, because it's so much class time has been spent on it and everybody's doing it, we have to have grades for it. So she has rubrics for her project and 
There's another thing that I wanted to say, which is we have some students who have IEPs or who are reading way below grade level, and they, we have developed a new option for their project. They do write a modified research paper, but then we have an option, um, an option for them to do a Google Slides deck, Google Slides presentation, um, that goes sequentially, that's modeled after the History Day model, it incorporates the theme, and the slides go build up background, heart of the story, short-term impact, long-term impact. So that's, um, I think I had a slide here. This is the Google, yeah, this is the rubric for the Google slide deck that we kind of designed for them with the help of the resource teacher, and this way, you know, everybody has a project that's not just cut and pasted. They used to like to cut and paste everything onto an exhibit board and then think that was going to be their project. And this is really, I think, requires a little bit more originality and creativity, though the other is an option as well. And then we do have a school history fair. And the school history fair has grown. Six, seven, and eight all participate. It reaches its one, usually a morning that we dedicate. It goes in the library, the classrooms. We have Chromebooks set up with the websites. We have exhibit boards in the library. We have the showing of documentaries um, available, though not everybody gets to see all the documentaries, I do sometimes, we show them in our classrooms to different groups. And that's just, I, we've done it in the evening too, but it's more inclusive to do it during the school day because everybody's there and parents are invited to walk through and different people from the district. I had looked for pic pictures, but I couldn't find them. Um, so the school history fair is, my, our principal is, has, is just so impressed. She uh, has only been there for, I think, four years. So when she came in, History Day was already a well-tuned wheel. And she was a little skeptical of how much class time we were spending on it. But when she saw the projects and the kids standing in the library explaining their projects, we won her over. She was just so impressed with the actual learning and the enthusiasm the students had for what they were, um, for what they were learning. And so um, we also really want to support our students who do go on to region. And by far in the past, the most popular categories were website, I would say, and documentary. And then um, we have had some really successful performances. I have been to nationals a few times, and the performances at nationals are just amazing. I love to see them, and I love to see them at the state level, too. Um, so this year, I, I'm really kind of excited about the new guidelines, and I know Rebecca's going to talk about them later, but we're going to have equal numbers in each category, and so students are going to have more of an incentive if they want to compete at the district level to really choose not, you know, a performance possibly. Um, and um, I, I'm just really excited about that. And the other thing is the papers, too. Now, when they choose the paper category, they can't be satisfied with the paper they wrote in my class is not the material that can be competitive at the regional or state level. They have to go back and redo it because they haven't really pulled in. You know, you need a ton of primary sources to be competitive. Um, and so they really have to expand on their research paper. And last year, papers were pretty popular in my school. We had several people um, win at the regional level and go on to states. And, you know, one that every, we were a little surprised at. You know, as a teacher, you think that after all these years, I'd be able to predict who's going to win. You can't. You don't, you just don't know what the judges are going to be impressed by. And um, we had, I had a student who wrote, she's a Beatles fanatic, and she wrote her paper on the Beatles last year, and she did so much research and had so many primary sources, she went all the way to states. I think she was third place, so she didn't get to go to nationals with that paper. 
but you know, you just never know. And that's why it really has to be about following the rules, following the guidelines, putting yourself into it, doing your best. And you know, if you win, it's awesome, but it's really not about that. Um, it's really not. Um, so we do make sure that they, you know, try to make sure there are no blatant rules violations. We're familiar enough with the rules before they go to district that we're looking things over to make sure there's no big rules violations. Um, we have looked over their annotated bibliographies and process papers. I don't believe that it's my job to proofread those word for word. I don't want to, you know, really give them an unfair advantage, but, you know, I make sure the margins are lined up and things like that, things that they can easily fix, make sure they had all the tools to put it together. Um, and the process paper is probably one of the most doable parts of the whole thing because it's pretty straightforward in terms of what should be included and what order it should come in. Um, and, you know, we do support the students with registration, and even with all that, it's easy for them to um, forget about deadlines, have a snowstorm the day before, the registrations are due, um, the parents might not have um, digital finances, so they can't pay the money online, and we have to help them with that. There's all kinds of stuff um, that you, you really have to work with, and I can apologize for our mistakes in the past and our, you know, last minute changes. Um, but, you know, they're people. We're all human beings, and everybody makes mistakes. And um, the Going to the conference on the day of the conference is also just a huge joy to see the different kinds of projects, to see the different kinds of people. The students are so happy to see their teachers there. And you know, you can't go to every contest every year, but to try to go, um, I have loved it. And I also want to put in a plug if you like History Day for being a judge. Um, because I really have got learned so much through being a judge. You really, really become familiar with the criteria, with, you know, with the difference between a project that really incorporate the theme, as Rebecca was saying, throughout the project and the ones that just tacked it on to the intro and the ending. Um, because you see this, you see such a variety. And you know, our schools are all different. And it's just, um, it's just very, very interesting to serve, you know, you meet very, you know, teachers from all over the state, and it's really a great, I think, experience to be a judge. I haven't always been able to do it, you know, every year we all have different things come up in our lives, but, you know, when I could, I have done that. Um, and then the students get their feedback forms. And the feedback forms as a teacher are also very, very interesting because you can see how your students have been rated by other professionals and maybe things that other historians have thought of um, that we never thought of or different comments. You know, I had a student write a paper and her judges really felt like she made some statements that weren't backed up with the text evidence and that she drew conclusions that she shouldn't have drawn and it really opened my eyes um, to some things that I hadn't considered. <coughs> so it's just a great learning experience as a teacher. And um, when you do have a winner, you know, at the regional level and you know they're going on to states, they have an opportunity to revise their project. The learning experience is not over. They take that judge's feedback, they go back and work on it again if they want to be competitive at the state level. Not everybody does. But the states are so much more competitive than the districts. It's a huge leap for them, and they don't realize that necessarily, um, that it's going to be that. And obviously, if you're going to nationals again, you know, it's the cream of the crop. Um, so nationals are also a lot of fun and very overwhelming, but very interesting and stimulating to see everything that's going on there. So, like I said, it's been a huge part of my career. 
even though now I've settled more on teaching English and I don't teach direct history classes, it's still something I love doing, love reading the different papers, love guiding students with the projects, and, you know, talk about them at home. I was telling um, Rebecca earlier, my son is in ROTC. He's going to be commissioning as an intelligence officer in the Air Force. And every year he asks me, what kinds of projects are your students doing for History Day? Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that we've always talked about at home, the types of projects. I have friends, social friends who have become judges now <laughs> because I told them about it and I recruited them. And every year they always ask me, what are your, your students doing? And we talk about, you know, the judging of the contest and what kind of projects there were after the contest. So that's also really fun. Um, and it's all best practices and all the standards are in it. So it's a win-win for everybody involved. I think that's all I had to say. I don't know how, have no idea what time it is. Um, if I'm on schedule, great. So, and I think if anyone has questions for Eden, this is a, a good time. I did print out you. I don't know if folks have grabbed this. It's um, we will send out slides, but she had a handout as well. And the handout is really it was something I made for myself. Um, I think I made it last year, a couple years ago, when I was planning the unit. Whenever I plan my units, I love tables. <laughs> so I like to make a table that has the due dates, the topic of the lesson, some links that I have to my own different documents, which you didn't get to see today. Um, I love put doing hyperlinks in my table, so I know where everything is and it all comes together. Um, but who has questions or things they want to bring up that maybe I didn't touch on? Joanne. Um, speak to your process from January through February of how you break down um, deadlines across category areas. So first of all, one thing I did leave out with my deadlines, because I teach seventh and eighth grade, and this year I think I have 96 students, I have staggered due dates, so seventh grade and eighth grade are due a week apart, because or else I would be going crazy trying to get it, because I really try to read things quickly and get them back quickly. So I stagger them that way. However, with the projects, so like the performance person's script, the mock-up of the exhibit board, the website first draft, all those would be due on the same day because it is just too confusing for the students and the teachers. Um, and there is a slide that you'll see that has that breakdown. The dates, I think, again, it might be from last year or even the year before, depending on which version I took. But you're going to plug in your own dates so that it goes step by step. Um, and the district competitions aren't really till March for the most part. Are any in February? There's one in February. Okay. The end of February. Yeah. So, you know, with the specific dates and the way the school year is made up, I definitely encourage modification of due dates to what fits your need in terms of holiday breaks and making sure the students have plenty of time to get everything home and ready to bring to the day of the contest when they're competing. Does that answer? Yeah, so it's almost like a first draft deadline and then like a more polished draft. But the, right, but the bibliography would be right, due right. more toward the end because they're still adding sources. Um, though they've done, a, they've done a bibliography for their paper already, so I've looked at it. And then they have to provide another one for their project, right, right. which might be the same one. Okay. Oh, I was going to say just kind of two, two, com two comments. So if anyone has like uh, skeptics um, in terms of administrations like that, I invite them in. And so we, because of that, um, for the last 10 years, um, our principal has found the monies for the registration. So the kids, so then that way it's a level playing field for everyone yeah. too. So invite them in. And then another way that I do is, you know, and I'm sure it's probably done uh, with your kids here at the high school, is um, 
different phases along the way. So when they have a topic or their thesis is we, we kind of do like a um, like a whole class. Everyone kind of puts their uh, like posters, puts their thesis there. I invite um, other core teachers, not just social studies, English, science. Um, it's kind of like a gallery walk, so that's <coughs> more perspectives, and, and the kids, so all the kids walk out with, I say, look, this is just not me critiquing you, this is a science teacher, this is a math teacher, um, the principal, uh, and it's a great, um, great way so that they can kind of see it's like, and then sometimes it's like, you know, I said, this is not a shame, you can kind of see they're like, ooh, mine is not like that one, but, um, and I, cause I don't have names on it, but everyone kind of knows what their topics are, but just, you know, it's kind of that, those just kind of like two observations. I love that idea of inviting the other teachers in because you might find also experts from, you know, somebody who has a special interest in a topic who can then, you know, work with that student a little bit. And we do also subsidize registration fees for anybody who asks um, to make sure it's an equitable playing field. Yeah, you know, a couple thoughts uh, as well is I, I'm really delighted <clears throat> to have Eden speak from the perspective of being a language arts teacher because the secret, maybe I should have Rich turn the camera off, the secret that we don't tell students <laughs> is that every project is a five paragraph paper mm -hmm. at its core. True. And that's where I think your kind of model is so successful because it allows for kids to do a paper and then turn it into a project. The, um, so I think that's a really kind of important thing. And I think the other thing about Worthington Hooker that is really successful is that it's a team. And I'm so happy. I'm the daughter and granddaughter of librarians, so I love libraries. So hearing so many library media specialists were with us is wonderful because Beth Hart, who Eden mentioned, um, it was such a huge part of the WH team and having a really strong media specialist to help kids with their research and finding things is, is just key. I think the other thing I just wanted to mention very quickly, and then I think we should all take a break because we're going on a tour and we can grab coffee, use the restroom if we need to. The, the other thing that I think is really key that Eden talked to is in the past, some teachers have been a little confused about how much they can help students on a project. And so we would have kids come to a regional contest and their teacher would not have helped them wouldn't have helped them because they felt like that was a violation of the rules. That is not correct. Um, basically, we teachers should feel free to help students as they would with any other project. They can't go and you know do the research for them or you know write the paper for them, but they are there to guide them and to help them. And you know we always kind of recommend to students, you know, as you were saying, you don't shouldn't have to go in and do every little you know, uh, grammar <coughs> section, but have students read to their peers um, or read to family members, you know, but teachers are there to guide them and to help them with the process. And, and actually, I'm looking at Tony, because a couple of years ago, he did a whole presentation on that, which is asking questions is often the best way of helping students. Um, but thank, thank and you. Also, I just wanted to put in a plug for the Connecticut History Day website because there's a lot of great links on it to help your students do their research. And they're the links that they should be using that guide them toward um, reliable sources, um, primary sources, and secondary sources. But so they're not just using Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia is a starting place. Um, all teachers know that. But you've done a great job over the years in really um, revamping it and having all these links for students that make it more accessible so they don't have to recreate the wheel and they know um, they can use their time optimally. Thank you. I appreciate that. We've, we try to listen to feedback and we have, we'll go over that a little bit more. But what I'm going to suggest is, a, first of all, a round of applause for you. And we have 10 minutes before we get to get up and take a tour and get to see the Windsor Historical Society. So I would say in this 10 minutes, the rest of you visit the restrooms if you need to, grab a cup of coffee. I think and if you have any more questions you want to add to the door. Yes, good idea.